really one of the most extraordinary panels. Christian Freeland, the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, Jan Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, President Duda of Poland, and the Director of National Intelligence of the United States, Avril Haines. Please come up. Let me begin, um, Avril Haines, with you, if I may. Uh, American intelligence these days is, uh, is, uh, has a, a justified reputation for being very good, having very accurately predicted what was going to happen in, in Ukraine last February, uh, so much so that I, I remember this well, that people in Ukraine did not believe it. People in the West, uh, in Europe, did not believe it. But you continued to press that that was, in fact, what was going to happen, and it did. So what's going to happen next? Where does, where does it look to you like the war is headed? Well, first of all, uh, thanks very much. And it's a great honor, frankly, to be on the stage with uh, all of the participants, including you, Farid. I think, um, I think we should be humble about, honestly, our uh, capacity initially in identifying the threat. And, you know, even for ourselves, it took us a while to really uh, adjust and absorb the fact that this was a real possibility that Putin was considering. And as we went out and we talked to our colleagues, obviously, in Ukraine, but also in the rest of Europe and around the world, we learned a lot from them and ultimately, obviously, came to the conclusion that this was real and continued to push on this issue. In terms of what's next, I mean, I think it's very much, um, the way we would say it is not a stalemate, but, but really a grinding conflict at this stage where, quite literally, <clears throat> we're talking about hundreds of meters being fought over in the context of the front lines. And, uh, you know, and I think, very much, again, as, as President Zelensky noted in our own analyst note, is that during the winter, we expected the tempo essentially to be reduced to some extent. And, uh, and we're watching, nevertheless, I think, uh, some just brutal fighting on uh, the front lines in this space. But I do think in many ways, and you know, my Ukrainian colleagues, Deputy Prime Minister and others will have a better sense of this, but I think from our perspective, uh, both militaries obviously have challenges. It will be extremely important for Ukraine to receive essentially military assistance and economic assistance moving forward uh, in order for them to be able to continue to manage what they have been heroically doing. And on the Russian side, we see also significant challenges, ammunition, supplies, morale, exhaustion, uh, some dysfunction in the leadership, and so on, things that are, I think, making it more difficult for the Russian uh, military as well. But I think I'll leave it to that and let others... Uh... But I thought we might get the view from Ukraine, because it does seem to me that what Putin is doing now is he seems to have decided he cannot defeat the Ukrainian army, but he is going to try to crush Ukraine, to defeat Ukrainian civilians, as it were, by massive bombardment of, you know, civilian housing, uh, power uh, stations, water treatment plants. Um, can you describe for us exactly the nature of the devastation and what can Ukraine do? Can it, can it manage to keep life going? So, yes, Ukraine keep fighting and keep developing. And what we recognized during these 329 days, that we uh, got a unique knowledge. And uh, I, I think that you feel it, that we can, our army train uh, to use uh, military uh, technology very quickly. We know how to use uh, military tech on, on, on a battlefield. And we want to use this knowledge uh, and we want to share this knowledge with the global world. But as I think that, uh, it's, it's unique experience for Ukrainians as we can maintain uh, energy grid under the constant uh, 
missile attack, uh, our teacher provided lesson for the children, despite of the, the shelling. Uh, you know, our trains uh, come in time, 96%. And uh, I think that it's unique knowledge, and I think that we can, this knowledge can share with the global world, as the uh, global world will require the new skills. And Ukrainians, during this war, it's, I agree that it's another perspective and it's another look at the war time, but still, we can offer to the world a new skills and new Ukrainians uh, that are born in Ukraine right now. So that's why I think that it's something we can offer to the world and something uh, that can attract foreign investment today, even during the war time. So we are very grateful for the IFIs that provided us with financial aid last year and President Zelensky noticed, and it helped us to keep macro-financial stability. But what uh, we do next, we need to start this early recovery. And of course, we are not able, like a developed country, to provide some incentives for companies, but we are able to provide this new energy, we are able to provide these new skills that we get through this 329 days of the wartime. President Duda, to me, it seems, um, it is striking to me how strong the West has been and other parts of the, of the world as well in supporting Ukraine. Do you think that the, the response is strong enough? And more importantly, what everybody worries about is it will it stay strong? Uh, Robert Gates and Condoleezza Rice wrote an article recently in which they said, Putin's goal, his strategy, is that he will outlast the West. The West may be strong now, but it will start splintering as an energy crises happen, as financial crises happen. Do you worry about that? First of all, I would like to thank you for your invitation, me to, to, to sit here with, in a, such a distinguished group of the participants of that panel and with, with the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine and in this very room with the First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska. Olena, thank you for coming. I know that here in this room there is a lot of real friends of Ukraine. I see also the President of, of, of Latvia, Thank you for coming. Uh, Ukraine, Ukraine. I, I, I know very well that you know. I know very, very well. Not only because we are talking about it all the time here, but uh, I know very well because five days ago, I, six days ago, I talked in Lviv with Volodymyr Zelensky. And I know very well that Ukraine needs weapon, weapon, as I said yesterday, and once again weapons. Weapons are crucial now because, because this war is really very difficult. This is not the end of the war. Russia is not defeating. There are, they are still Russians. They are still very strong. There is a lot of Russian soldiers on the front line, and we are afraid that uh, they are preparing, now they are preparing themselves to the new offensive in a few months, probably. So this is crucial to send now additional military support to Ukraine, especially modern tanks, especially modern missiles to defend Ukraine, but, all, but first of all to stop Russian offensive. And this is, and this is a crucial element. Is it enough? This is the question. I'm afraid it's not that this, this this assistance we've just sent to, 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 to Ukraine is still not enough. Uh, Ukraine needs more our efforts, 
It's more our aid and we should mobilize ourselves to help them because it's, uh, the situation is, is really difficult and I'm afraid now it is and it will be in a few, maybe months, maybe weeks, a crucial moment, next crucial moments of this war. And, and this moment will answer for the question, <clears throat> will Ukraine survive or not? I am a neighbor of Ukraine. I am a president of Poland. Poland is, a, as you know, member of NATO and member of European Union. We understand Ukrainians. We know that they really want to be members of the Western society, members of the Western political community, members of the Western security zone, security area, so they want to be members of European Union, they want to be members of NATO, but first of all, they have to survive. They have to uh, maintain their country, they have to maintain their sovereignty, they have to remain free, and this is, and now this is crucial, we have to help them. They want to have democracy, and we are members of democratic countries, so for us, this voice, voice of Ukrainian society, they will should be crucial. They will is to be part of the European, real European society and part of the North Atlantic society. We should hear them. We should listen their voice. Thank you. Christia, um there are two deputy prime ministers on the podium, so I hope you don't mind, Krista, if I call you Krista. Um, how would you respond to this question? Do you worry about the staying power of the West? Um, so the short answer is, of course, it would be stupid and naive not to. But I think we're going to do it. Um, and I think, you know, of course I worry. I am ultimately extremely confident. And I am extremely confident first and foremost because of the magnificent, magnificent job Ukraine is doing. Um, we saw President Zelensky just now. I think it's right for all of us to honor Olena Zelenska, who is here with us, and of course, Yulia, um, and the people of Ukraine. And, you know, President Duda said something very important, many important things. Um, one was, we need to listen to the Ukrainians. And Yulia said it too. We, we need to get out of a mindset, which I think a lot of us had when the Soviet Union first collapsed, of like, we were the smart guys, and they weren't such smart guys. I also apologize to the Latvians for this attitude. Um, and we need to realize there's a lot we can learn from what Ukraine is doing right now. Uh, and that is ultimately the reason that I think we should have a lot of confidence. I think Ukraine <clears throat> is teaching all of us, again, the true strength of democracy. Something that in good times, it's easy to not think about that much, free. And I think what we see in Ukraine is people who are free, people who understand what they're fighting for, and I think very critically, people who have social solidarity. You know, it is so important that President Zelensky is there, that you have millionaires, multimillionaires, and their sons and daughters in Ukraine and on the front line. This is a fight of the whole country. So that's the first reason I'm confident. But the second reason I'm confident is, you know, President Duda quite rightly pointed out 
that this is a fight ultimately about values, and it is. But I think we in the West also need to understand that that victory that President Zelensky spoke about and that time which he said we need to use, um, it's not about doing Ukraine favors um, that we're talking about. Supplying Ukraine with weapons, and as President Zelensky very crucially pointed out, supplying Ukraine with the money it needs to win the war is ultimately in our own self-interest. So I'm a finance minister. And if you were to say to me, what is the one thing that G7 finance ministers, G7 governments this year could do that's actually in our power, right? We don't control COVID. We don't control global supply chains. We don't control whether there will be immaculate disinflation or not. One thing where we have some real practical levers is we can help Ukraine win clearly, definitively. And if we do that, if that happens this year, you know it as well as I do, Fareed. That would be a huge boost to the global economy. So I do think Ukraine is going to win. I think Ukraine is going to win because the Ukrainians have shown total commitment and determination, and they've shown they're smart. I think we're going to win because our people, like I think, which is so often the case in democracy, people are smarter than their leaders. Um, certainly speaking for Canada, Canadians got this on day one. They understand that we need to stand up for democracy and democratic values, but they also understand our economies, our security, the fact that nuclear deterrence actually works. All of these critical things are really being decided on the battlefields of Ukraine right now. So I am, of course, worried. Um, we would be stupid not to be. But I am ultimately profoundly confident. Mr. Secretary General, you heard the president of Ukraine say he would like to be a member of NATO. Will you let him in? NATO's position remains unchanged, and that is that Ukraine will become a member of uh, NATO. Uh, then, of course, the main focus now is to support Ukraine, uh, to ensure that Ukraine wins the war and uh, prevails as a sovereign, independent, democratic nation uh, in Europe. And that's the reason why uh, NATO allies partners uh, are providing unprecedented military support uh, to Ukraine and why I'm traveling around to NATO capitals and calling on them to do even more and why I welcome the recent announcement of more armor, more advanced uh, air defense systems, uh, most recently by by, by Canada with 200 armoured vehicles and, uh, and also uh, Poland uh, uh, delivering more uh, weapons and of course the US leading all these efforts in, the, in this what we call the, the contact group or the support group for, for uh, uh, Ukraine. Um, and as uh, Krista just said, it is extremely important that President Putin doesn't win this war. Partly because it will be a tragedy for the Ukrainians, but it will be very dangerous for all of us. Because then the message to authoritarian leaders, not only to Putin, but also other authoritarian leaders, is that when they use brutal force, when they violate international law, they achieve what they want. And that will be a very bad and dangerous lesson. It will make, make the world more dangerous and us more vulnerable. And that's the reason why, uh, if we want a negotiated peaceful solution to the war in Ukraine, we need to provide military support to Ukraine. That's the only way. Uh, weapons, uh, uh, they are the way to peace. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that may sound like a paradox, but, uh, but the only way to have a negotiated uh, agreement is to convince President Putin that he will not win on the battlefield. He has to sit down and, uh, and negotiate. Nobody knows uh, uh, how this war will end. Most likely it will end uh, around the negotiating table. Uh, what, what we do know is that what happen, uh, happens around that negotiating table is totally depend on the strength of the battlefield. And if we want uh, Ukraine to prevail, then uh, they need uh, the military uh, strength. Uh, then let me add one more thing. And that is that 
we are all encouraged, inspired. We admire the, the, the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian uh, political leadership, uh, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, at the same time, I think it's very uh, dangerous to underestimate Russia. They have mobilized 200,000 more troops. Uh, President Putin has demonstrated a will to just sacrifice thousands and thousands of uh, young Ukrainian, uh, no, sorry, R Russian uh, soldiers. Uh, they are now acquiring uh, more and more weapons, reaching out to other authoritarian regimes, including uh, 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 Iran, uh, and they are planning new offensives. So, so it is, as President Zelensky said, there is an urgent need. Time matters. We will meet in Rammstein, uh, NATO allies uh, in the US-led uh, 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 contact group for Ukraine with, with all the many partners, and the main message there will be uh, more support, and more advanced support, heavier weapons, uh, and, and more we modern weapons. Uh, because uh, this is a fight for our values, this is a fight for democracy, and we just have to prove that democracy wins over uh, tyranny and oppression. Avril, you are President Biden's senior most representative here at Davos. Uh, what would be your message in the context of what President Duda and, and, and uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada and the Secretary General of NATO said, what would your message be to Ukrainians about what America will do to help the Ukrainians? About what? Sorry. What the United States can and will do to help Ukraine. I mean, I, so I'm the intelligence community and I don't do policy, but obviously, President Biden and uh, the United States have allocated hundreds of millions of dollars, in weapons, and in fact, billions of dollars in uh, support for Ukraine. And honestly, I mean, I think maybe one way to think about it is it, on top of everything else that's been said about the impact for the world in the event that Ukraine does not succeed, are a series of other things. There is clarity about the fact that, honestly, uh, the conflict in Ukraine has global implications beyond the rule of law, beyond even the values piece, all of which I would prioritize in many respects, but for um, economic implications, it has uh, consequences for us in thinking about um, the strength of our alliances. It has consequences for us in thinking about how it is that we're going to manage crises in the future, where we have actors that violate the rule of law and the, um, the charter and the, the order that we have set up. It also has consequences from a proliferation perspective, which is to say that the nuclear saber rattling that Russia has done is another message that's been sent to other countries in this context. I think the... Um, I think there are uh, many who are watching what happens in Ukraine, and it will affect how they address conflicts in the future. So I think there's just no question that it is in all of our interests to support Ukraine as much as possible. I think Deputy Prime Minister of Canada said it exactly right, which is to say that it Yes, we do want to support Ukraine for Ukraine because we're watching what they're going through and we want to be there for them and the heroic uh, actions that they've taken are extraordinary, but we're not doing it just for Ukraine, we're doing it also for our self-interest and there are a series of ways in which you can look at this to recognize the implications for our foreign policy, our national security collectively moving forward. You know the Ukrainians are asking for more and more advanced weaponry, longer range. Um, do you think the administration is likely to move forward on some of those requests? Again, I, I'm sorry, I just can't speak for the policy community in this scenario as the intelligence officer, but I mean, I, I have seen, obviously, the president and his national security cabinet in the policy space continue to move forward on a variety of requests, and I think that will continue. President Duda, um, you talked about how you believe uh, how urgent and important it is to act now. Um, but I do want to ask you a little bit more about this question of the staying power, partly because your country has done an extraordinary job that I think so sometimes we, we, we don't adequately recognize. You've taken in over two million Ukrainian refugees, and there are no refugee camps. These are all 
people who are being housed individually by individual Polish families in their homes. Do you think this can go on for years? I mean, what are you, a politician? You understand, you, are you, do you get the sense the Polish people are getting tired of playing the role of host to all these refugees? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this important, very important words. Uh, because uh, I want to, uh, I want to stress, I want that I'm, I'm really very proud of, of my um, compatriots, Polish people. They, they, they didn't need any, any encouragement to go to the borders to 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 to, to help. Uh, Ukrainian refugees, we call them Ukrainian guests because they are our neighbors and guests. Uh, they are in very difficult situation, but we fully understand that uh, if, if there is anything we can do for defenders of Ukraine, for Ukrainian heroes, who defend Ukraine every day for those fathers, brothers and sons. We should protect their families, their wives, their children, their sisters, carry on them, and we are trying to do our best. As a neighbors, And this is, and this is, this is, this is something we know very well. Yes, this is something we we treat as a natural thing, as a as a normal behavior. This is the first. The second is assistance. Poland remains committed to continuing to provide Ukraine with uh, military equipment. Uh, Ukraine needs to, to defend its sovereignty, to defend its independence, to defend its border, and to, I hope, to win this war and to def de defeat Russians. Because this is crucial element. So I'm very grateful, Mr. Secretary General, dear Jens, for, uh, for this very important words you said a minute ago. Um, because as I said before, we talked with President uh, of Lithuania with Gitanas Nauseda. We talked, uh, we, we had a meeting in Lviv six days ago. We called this forum Lublin Triangle, Lithuania, Poland, and Ukraine. So there was a meeting of three presidents. And we talked about the coming NATO summit in Vilnius. Yes. And, 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 and we said to Volodymyr Zelensky, Volodymyr, we can assure you that doors to NATO are still open for Ukraine and we support your future membership in NATO. Volodymyr said, okay, guys, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very, really grateful, but listen, frankly, I don't want to hear the same story once again, okay? I need guarantees. I can understand that you, that you can't agree on our full membership in NATO now because we have war. And taking into account Article 5 of the, of the, trans, of the North Atlantic Treaty, it's impossible. And, um, I understand it, he said, but I need guarantees. 
I need guarantees for my country, I need guarantees of security. And please, talk with your NATO allies, because we need it. We need it immediately. And if you, and if you decide to give us these guarantees during the upcoming NATO summit, it will be real success. Success of NATO and success of Ukraine. And this is crucial. So, Mr. Secretary General, <laughs> I will be very grateful. <laughs> uh. Uh, Yulia, can I ask you to give us a sense of the I mean, you must have given some thought to what will it cost to rebuild Ukraine? To, you, looking at the, the devastation, you know, we look at the photographs and the video, and it's like s something out of World War II, because I really don't <clears throat> think we have seen the targeted destruction of cities in quite this way. People sometimes refer to the Russian bombing as indiscriminate bombing. I don't think it's indiscriminate. It is discriminate is targeted precisely at civilians, at civilian infrastructure. It is de designed to destroy civilian life. What, when you think about this problem, because you are likely to inherit it, how, how, help us understand the scale of what you're thinking about. Okay, we will, so I want to tell that Ukraine are fight on two fronts. One is a military one, another one is economic front. And uh, if we speak about numbers and figures, um, so if you look at the World Bank estimation, um, on September, um, the number was 300, 350 billion US dollars, but now we estimate that it, it might be up to one, uh, one trillion, as you know, every day our energy grid under the massive uh, missile strike. So every, every day we get another damages, that, that's why, it's so important uh, to find a way to supply us weapon, to give us guarantees, to help us, and with contribution, that is contribution to the victory, for the victory, uh, to find a way how to obtain the victory, get the victory in the nearest year, this year, let's say like this. Uh, as I think no one, no one doubt that Ukraine win, will win this war. I think no one doubt. The question is that the question that was raised by the president, we shortage of time. That's why we need right now uh, to collaborate with each other and to find a way how to supply us more weapon, anti-missile system, heavy weapon, uh, tanks, just to speed up our victory. Because every day brings more damages, and it means that exactly on the second day of the victory, we will come to our allies and we will ask for finance the rebuilding of Ukraine, and it will cost more than it might cost right now. But that's why it has a huge impact on economic uh, globally, and that's why it's so important from economic point of view to find a way, sanction policy, weapon supply, and uh, policy, and the uh, help of our um, uh, allies in, in financial support right now, just to, to put like a goal, like a, a name, to get the victory during this year. Krista, you're a money person. Um, this, is a, this is a challenge for the West at a time when deficits and debt loads are high. W will it be possible to provide Ukraine with the kind of assistance on the scale it needs to rebuild? Well, before we get to rebuilding, we have to support Ukraine in its fight, and we have to support Ukraine to victory. And I do want to emphasize something that Yulia said about the economic battlefield, and I think she's exactly right. You know, the weapons, absolutely essential. But one of the remarkable things happening in Ukraine right now is it is a functional state. As Yulia said, trains running on time 96% of the time. When President Zelensky went to Kherson, liberated Kherson, one of the first things he said is, now you will get your pensions, and we're going to pay you all the pensions you didn't get when you were under occupation. 
I think we cannot underestimate how important Ukraine's continued existence as a functional state is to the winning of the war. So we need to get the money now. And it's remarkable, Yulia, bravo, that you guys have been doing it. And we need to continue to support that effort. Um, I, we heard, I think, from Yulia uh, thanking the international financial institutions. But we need to keep going. Ukraine needs an IMF program. We should make meaningful progress there in the first quarter. And the countries here need to continue to provide support. You spoke, Fareed, and you're absolutely right about being sure that there's public buy-in. So I'll tell you one thing that we did in November, which is Canada issued Ukraine sovereignty bonds. These are guaranteed by Canada's AAA credit rating. They're a Government of Canada bond, but all of the money was earmarked to go directly to Ukraine. We issued $500 million worth of sovereignty bonds, and they were sold out in less than two weeks. Um, the Central Bank of Poland bought some of those bonds, so thank you very much, Pana Presidente. Um, and, you know, I think we as democratic Western leaders need to also be, you know, President Zelensky is doing a great job of making sure that our people understand the importance of this fight. I think we also need to be doing that job. And we need to be sure that we are talking, you know, in my case with Canadians, about why this matters. And I actually find they tell me why it matters. But I need to give them opportunities to be part of this fight. And I just, I want to quickly pick up on one thing that Avril said that could kind of get missed, I think, in the flow of all the things we've been talking about which is the nuclear deterrence point. And I think this is one element. You know, when we talk about the benefits that we get from a Ukrainian victory, one of them that I think we have to really be mindful of is what a Ukrainian victory would mean and what a Ukrainian defeat would mean for nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation in the world. Because I think if Ukraine were to be defeated, then what that tells you is no matter how much you want your sovereignty, no matter how united you are as a country, no matter how prepared you are to fight, if you are fighting a bigger country that has nuclear weapons, you're going to lose. And think about the message that sends to smaller countries around the world. I think an extremely dangerous one. And so from my perspective, that is yet another reason that in supporting Ukraine, we are supporting our own economic well-being and also our own security. Uh, Avril, let me pick up on that, but on something more, uh, more specific. I think we all know that the, the, the elephant in the room with regard to the consequences of a Russian victory are the fear that it would signal to China that it was um, permissible, acceptable, or it would come at low cost for them to invade Taiwan. Take us through your, your intelligence judgment of what the effect of a Russian victory would be on China. Yeah, I think, I mean, first of all, um, let me apply what uh, was just said um, about the nuclear saber rattling in relation to China. So we've indicated in our annual threat assessment that among the things that we're seeing is China engaging in a pretty extraordinary expansion of their nuclear program. And, uh, and I think one of the things that we look at is um, essentially what is the lesson that they're learning from the consequence of the conflict that we've seen and uh, in this space. And, you know, our assessment would be that basically it has caused them likely to just uh, confirm their own view that this is critical as a deterrent and that they can use that program effectively in order to do the kind of nuclear saber rattling that we've seen Russia do in this context. So that's kind of one piece of the puzzle. I, another to your point is that I think, first of all, we haven't seen 
ultimately the final chapter in effect on this. And so we can't really give you, here are all of the lessons that China has learned as a consequence of the conflict. But I think there are a couple of things that are worth highlighting. One is that I think um, it is likely that we exceeded their expectations in terms of our capacity to join together you know, as an alliance of states across the world to actually counter Russia in this space. So that would be one, and particularly on the sanctions piece. And I think one of the challenges is that sanctions in the context of Russia versus China have some interesting differences, right? So if you were to enact a significant uh, ban of sanctions vis-a-vis -vis China, you're likely to have greater impact on China because of its integration with the world economy. At the same time, it will also create more sacrifice, essentially, in those who are enacting those sanctions. So that's one piece of it. Another, I think, is the export control piece. We've really, you know, export controls are used in a pretty remarkable way uh, during this conflict, and they've been quite effective, so far as we can tell, in, um, and targeted in their impact, and they've been done as a coalition, which I think is another aspect of it that's important for uh, countries that concern themselves with disadvantaging their own businesses in the context of export controls. And so that's another, I think, thing that China is likely watching, and you know, we see both China and Russia doing a lot of thinking, as they have in the past, about how do you effectively create a system that provides you with greater resilience so that you can counter the actions of those sanctions. But I would say I, one of the things that is remarkable is the way, I think, in which the coalition of states that have enacted sanctions have been capable of kind of watching how the evasion has been operating on Russia's side and adjusting as a consequence, and therefore maintaining some of the pressure that exists in this space. I, you know, another issue that they're almost certainly watching is the kind of information war that Russia is waging and trying to think through how it is that uh, that, that goes. And I think we've also seen, you know, China ultimately, you know, in our view, engage in a number of uh, activities that are supportive of Russia and yet not coming out explicitly in support and feeling a little bit uncomfortable about where that puts them in these spaces. So I, I mean, there's a, a number of things that we could continue to go down the road of, and certainly there's military kind of lessons that they're undoubtedly learning. Um, you know, and among the things that would seem most likely is that you really want to overmatch essentially in this context and have a quick conflict as opposed to allowing effectively the world to come together to provide assistance and to help in these spaces. But I think it's a, it is still a story to be told as we kind of watch this move forward. Um, Secretary General, can you give us an update on where things stand with Sweden and Finland's uh, accession to, the, to, to NATO? It does appear from the outside that the Turks are simply blackmailing uh, uh, NATO uh, or Sweden in particular. It, it, it feels like a bargain where they, you know, they just keep, they, they keep asking for more until they get, because they know at the end of the day they have leverage right now. Um, it, it feels inappropriate for NATO to have to behave like this. It looks more like a bazaar. Well, I'm confident that uh, Turkey will uh, finalize the uh, accession process uh, for Finland and Sweden. I cannot tell you when, uh, but I'm confident for several reasons. First of all, uh, Turkey was one of the NATO allies that uh, at our summit in Madrid in uh, July last year uh, actually decided to invite Finland and Sweden to become uh, members of the alliance. Uh, and all NATO allies, also Turkey, a few days after, signed the accession protocols. And so far, 28 out of NATO's 30 allies have already ratified. This is the quickest, quickest fastest, fastest accession process in NATO's modern history. Normally, accession into NATO takes years. Uh, it's less than a year since Finland and Sweden applied. They applied in May. They were invited in July. And already 28 out of 30 have uh, ratified. Um, uh, uh, second, we need to, to, to understand where we started. Uh, weeks or a couple of months before the invasion of Ukraine, President Putin proposed a security treaty with NATO. 
where we actually outlined some key demands. One was that NATO should guarantee no more NATO uh, uh, members, no uh, further enlargement of NATO. The other main demand was to remove all NATO uh, forces infrastructure in uh, all allies that have joined after 1997, meaning uh, the whole of the eastern uh, part of the uh, alliance. Of course, we did, we did uh, reject that, uh, those demands. But it demonstrates that the purpose, the aim of President Putin is to get less NATO. He's getting exactly the opposite. Hours after the invasion, we uh, significantly increased the number of NATO troops in the eastern part of the alliance, including in Poland, uh, to send a very clear message to, to Moscow uh, 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 that there is no room for misunderstanding about NATO's readiness, uh, ability, commitment to protect and defend all NATO allies. And that is to prevent escalation because it's extremely bad what's going on in, uh, in Ukraine now. But of course, if this escalates to full-fledged war between Russia and NATO, it becomes even worse. So the increased military presence in, uh, in the Eastern part of the alliance is not to provoke a conflict, but to prevent the conflict, preserve peace, send a clear message of deterrence to uh, Moscow. That is more NATO, is getting more NATO on Putin's border. The other thing is that Finland and Sweden applied because of the threats uh, he, he, he conveyed. They actually realized the door was going to, uh, uh, to, to also, they were afraid that the door to NATO was closing, so they asked to, to, to get in. Uh, and, and, and they will become members. And the last thing I will say on this is that Finland and Sweden are in a very different place now than before they applied. Because since they applied, uh, several allies, including the United States, have issued uh, bilateral security assurances. And NATO has increased its presence in, in that part of uh, Europe. Finland and Sweden are now as invitees participating in NATO's political meetings, consultations, and are more and more integrated into our uh, 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 military structures. So it's absolutely inconceivable that there will be a military threat against Finland or Sweden without NATO reacting. So Pre President Putin wanted less NATO, he's getting more NATO, and uh, that's an uh, 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 important message. Let, let me make sure we get, we get this clear, because this is very Im Im important, because it is a window of uh, an awkward period or a or dangerous period. If Russia would attack Finland or, NATO or Sweden tomorrow, even though they are not NATO members, NATO would come to the assistance of those two countries. As what I'm saying is that it's inconceivable that we will not react. I mean, they are now not only close partners, they are invitees. They are integrated in our, into our military uh, 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 structures. Uh, and we have uh, bilateral security uh, assurances from several allies. So, so it, 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 we need to react. Uh, Moscow knows that. And they also know that they are now devoted most of their troops uh, uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, so actually the, the likelihood for any uh, as a military attack is, is very little, uh, partly because they are so close to NATO and partly because they are now spending so much of, the Russia is spending so much of their forces in the Ukraine. The last thing I'll say on, uh, on Turkey is that Turkey has some legitimate uh, security concerns. No other NATO ally has suffered more terrorist attacks than Turkey. PKK is regarded as a terrorist organization by uh, NATO allies, uh, by Finland and Sweden, long before they applied. Uh, and therefore, part of the agreement in Madrid was also to sign a joint memorandum between uh, Turkey, Finland and Sweden uh, to step up cooperation. Uh, for instance, uh, lift all restrictions on arms exports. Finland and Sweden have done that already. And to work more closely in fighting terrorism. And that's actually something uh, which is important for Turkey, but also for NATO allies. We have run out of time, but I want to ask one per We have a special guest in the audience, the founder of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab. I went, Klaus, is there anything you would like to ask or add uh, at this moment? No, not at And, and we have seen that support. Klaus Schwab, thank you so much. To this extraordinary panel, my thanks. And of course, to President Zelensky. Please tell him that we really appreciated it.